Hi everyone and welcome back to the organic modeling with WASP tutorial. So in this uh, third tutorial what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking uh, the same approach that we've been seeing in the first two tutorials so the approach of generating meshes from the attributes of the geometry but rather than using static attributes we're going to be instead using as attributes just the building blocks that we will need to construct the meshes and then we're going to be after uh, the aggregation uh, parametrically modify these attributes so that we will not have the same attribute everywhere but attributes that have a parametric variation in different locations in our assembly. Let's get started. If you download the uh, file that you can find in the description you will find a very simple stochastic aggregation. For the specifics of making the process a little bit simpler I decided to use this very simple aggregation which is composed exclusively of uh, tetrahedrons. Uh, rather than the aggregation that I've been using in the previous um, tutorials just because this simplifies a couple of processes. However, you can build this same uh, system on that same process and you might try out and if you have any problems you can just write in the comments or in the Discord channel and I can provide you with a file that will show you how to do it on the uh, file we have seen in the pre two previous tutorials. So what we want to do is we want to create some attributes but rather than creating the full geometry of the attributes, we are just going to create an attribute that will simply store the information we need to construct this geometry. And instead of constructing this geometry before aggregation, we are going to do it afterwards so that we can modify it for through different parameters. And what we are going to be doing is we are then going to be using a point to modify the dimension of uh, each geometry within each part. Uh, to do that, we have to start by creating two attributes that we're going to store in our part. And the first attribute that we're going to need is we're going to need the center of our part. We could, of course, compute it after aggregation, but it's just easier to uh, already calculate it in there. And then we're going to need the, um, the outer edges of each face, which is what we're going to be used then to create our geometry. So let's go on and let's go to the wasp tab and get an attribute component and so the first attribute is going to be called center it's going to have as a value it's going to have the centroid of our part and we're going to find that with a volume component which we're going to connect to our part geometry. So maybe we can hide our geometry as well as our component here. So we see that this component returns us the centroid of our uh, tetrahedron, which is here. And we can plug that to value. And we then have to create a toggle, which is set to true to say that this attribute is transformable. We are then going to create a second attribute, again going to the WASP tab and getting an attribute component. We are going to call this attribute faces. And the value of this attribute is going to be the outline of each of uh, the faces of our geometry. So what we are going to do is we are going to use a dbrep component. To explode our geometry and here we're going to have our four faces we are then going to do a wireframe component to get the edges of each of them we are going to join them through join curves and we are then going to plug them into the value in uh, into our attribute and also make sure that we right click and select flatten. In this way all our curves or our four faces are in the same list and instead of creating four attributes, one per face, we're going to create a single attribute that stores all the four faces. So then as well, same story, we are going to create a boolean toggle, set it to true and connect it to our attribute. Now that we created our two attributes here, what we can do is we can use a merge component to put them together into the same list. 
And we're gonna then connect this merge to the attribute input of our part. In this way, when we aggregate our component, these attributes will be carried along together with our part. If now we go on and we reset our aggregation, we of course have our geometries here, but that's not what we are interested. What we're gonna be doing next is we're gonna go to elements and we're gonna get a component called get attribute by name. And we're gonna go on and extract our attributes. So our first attribute was called center. And so this attribute will return the centroid of all my parts. And then I'm gonna copy paste this a bit lower. And I'm gonna change this to faces. And now this one will return me all the uh, face outlines of my geometry. So now that I'm done with this, I can right click and hide my part geometry because I can simply work from here. Now that we extracted our attribute, we wanna continue and by creating our uh, geometry. And what we wanna do is we wanna create our geometry by in the similar way of what we've done in the previous tutorial, which is by connecting uh, an offset of each face to the center of our geometry and creating this pipe-like structure. So, but what we wanna do also is we don't wanna simply create this geometry, but we wanna create it using uh, the distance from a point as an attractor in order to control the scaling of these different attributes. So let's see how we can do that. So first of all, let's look at how we can scale those geometry inwards. So we wanna scale them in two ways. The first way is we wanna scale all the faces in inwards to create the inner core of our geometry. And then we wanna scale each face uh, on itself in order to create the end of our pipes. We'll do that by creating a scale component. I'm gonna keep a bit of space because we're gonna have to do a little bit more. And so, first of all, we wanna scale our faces. And we wanna scale them around, each of them around their center, so they're gonna collapse the center of the, around the center of the part. And now I'm gonna put, for example, a slider to control that. So through this slider, I can control the scaling of that element. What we wanna also do is we wanna do the same thing, but directly on each face. So to do that, we are gonna um, create um, another scale component, where we're gonna again connect our faces as the scaling. But this time, we don't wanna scale around the center, but around the center of each face, which we have to first of all calculate using a polygon center component. And then we're gonna connect that to here. And we could, for example, connect the same slider. So you see that now with this slider, we can control the scaling of both the inner and the faces themselves. Now that we created these two geometries, what we can do is we can simply loft them using a loft component in order to create our geometries. Oh, sorry. We need to first of all right click and graft each of these inputs. And now you'll see that what we are creating here is effectively a geometry that is very similar to what we had in our uh, previous tutorial. So it's a, a pipe structure which connects the center of each face to the center of the part. However, this is not really what we wanted to achieve because we didn't want to have all these components being all the same, 
but we wanted to be able to control the scale of all these components based on some parameter. And this parameter in our case will be uh, the distance from a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Rhino and draw a point somewhere in space. Doesn't really matter where. And in Grasshopper, I'm going to again create a point component. Right click, set one point, and import that point. I'm going to also group it so that I can just see it there. What we want to do then, now that we imported our point, is we want to measure the distance that exists from this point to uh, from this point to the center of each part and from this point and to the center of each face and use this value to scale the geometries accordingly so to do that we're going to use a distance component we're going to connect our center points and my point and this is going to return me the individual distances what I want to do is I want to remap those distances so that they're going to be in a range that makes sense for me to uh, control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a remap component. I'm going to connect this here. For the start domain, I'm going to use a bounds component. And very important, whenever you use a bounds component on a much more complex list, you want to right click and flatten the input so that it's going to be calculating the value over the whole list. And then what we want to do is I'm going to, for example, want to make the geometries very big when I'm close to the point and very small when I'm far away. So to do that, I'm going to uh, create a domain a construct domain component which I'm gonna place a bit backwards because I'm gonna use it for both of them and I'm gonna say that I'm gonna go for example from say so when I'm very close I want something very big so it's gonna be 0 0.9 and when I'm far away I want it very small so 0 0.1 I'm gonna connect A and B and I'm going to then connect my domain to the T input of my remap numbers. If I now go on and connect this value as a factor in my geometry, you'll notice that my geometries are effectively very small when I'm close to my point, very big when I'm close to the point, and very small when I'm far away. And you see that if I move my point around, this kind of changes. What we might want to do is we might want to have a little bit more control over how this transition happens. And so to have a bit more control, we can actually add a graph mapper. Which we can make it small. We're going to connect the output of our remap numbers to our graph mapper and then connect the output of the graph mapper to our factor. So by default, this will not do anything. But if we right click, go to graph types and select Bezier, what we can do then is we can double click on it and modify the way in which the transition happens. And in this case, you see that the transition from very large to very small is much quicker. And so we can use this curve to control how this transition happens. Great, now that we have done this, we can very quickly select our distance component, our remapping function, and our graph mapper. And using Ctrl C and Ctrl V, we are gonna copy them down here. And what we are gonna do is, instead of using the center of each part, we're gonna use the center of each face to do exactly the same process. So I'm gonna connect this to here. And now I'm going to use the output here as the factor for scaling the, uh, the other geometries. 
So now you see that effectively we are scaling everything consistently. And what's interesting is also that the geometries are not all the same within one, but they actually start scaling because the faces are changing. Great. Now that we have the base structure that we would want to build, what we're going to do next is we're going to do what we've been seeing already in the previous tutorial, which is convert this to a mesh and then smooth it in order to visualize it um, in a better way. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our lofts here and we're going to first of all right click on the output and flatten it so that all our meshes will be into one big list. We are going to then use a, a join vrep component to join them into a single geometry. And what we can also do is once we are here, we can just go back and hide everything we have been doing so far. What we are going to do now, now that we have this vrep, we are going to use a cap holes component to close all the open holes that the geometry has. And now, and this was the main reason to use a tetrahedron, which is much simpler, the conversion to a mesh is simpler than what we had the last time, because since our geometry is entirely made of um, square and triangular faces, so it's either rectangular faces or triangular faces, what we can do very quickly is we can use a simple mesh component. Oops, sorry. What we can do is we can use a simple mesh component. And what this component does is it converts a mesh to its, to its simplest possible representation. And so that's going to work very well exclusively if you have uh, triangular and quadrangular faces. If you start adding more complex faces like we had in the previous example, like an hexagon, this is going to start introducing holes in your geometry. So. We're going to plug this and this is going to very quickly convert our whole mesh, our old BREP to a mesh. And what we also want to do is we're going to use the, we're going to go to the Weaver Bird tab and we're going to use a join mesh and weld component as we used the last time. It's not strictly necessary because that's going to be already uh, clean. But what this component does is it's cleaning up a little bit the mesh topology. And it's also recomputing the normals, which makes sure that our geometry is nice and clean. What we can do now is we can do also another little thing before doing our uh, smoothing uh, process that we've seen before, is we can also use the value of our point attractor that we have, that we have there, not only to control the scaling of this, but also to control the color of our mesh. So what we can do is we can have a color of in each vertex that changes based on the distance from our attractor point. In order to do that, we are going to first of all deconstruct our mesh. And this is going to return as our vertices, our faces, and our uh, vertex colors. So, what we are going to do then is we're going to go back and we're going to create a new point component. We're going to connect it to our point and then we're going to drag it at the end here. If you want to keep things nice and clean, what you can also do is you can right click and hide the wire. In this way, you don't have wires running all around your grasshopper file. What we're going to do is we're going to do the same that we've been doing before. So we're going to use a um, distance component calculate the distance of each vertex from the point. We are going to then remap this value. And we're going to again use a bounds component to calculate their original boundary. And then we are not going to change the uh, target domain because we want it between 0 and 1 to create colors. And so now that we have a set of values between 0 and 1, 1 for each vertex, what we can do is we can use a gradient component to generate the colors. And so if you've never used a gradient component, is a gradient component is a component that has colors in there and it has this line in the middle. And so you might imagine that the, the point here is the minimum value 
in this case that is set at L0, which is by default 0. And the values here is the maximum value, which is L1, and by default is set to 1. So if we set, if we fit in a set of values that are between 0 and 1, what we are actually going to be doing is we are going to be creating a list of colors which will be proportional to the for each value to the position on this line. So I'm going to go on and connect this. And you can right click on this component and change between different presets. For example, I'm going to go for the green one this time, or maybe I'm going to go, since we are doing everything black and white in this series, I'm going to go for the white. And what you can also do is you can drag, grab these handles and move them around, or you can also right click on them and change the color. What we can now do is we can do the opposite of what we've done. So we're going to use construct mesh. And we're going to reconstruct our mesh with the same vertices, the same faces. But instead of using the same colors, which were empty, we're going to assign these colors as colors. And if we now hide what we had before, you see that our mesh effectively changes color as well as scale based on the position of this point. I mean, now it's not maybe super visible because it's not really dark. So I might right click and make this color a bit darker. There you go. Great. Now that we have our mesh and it's colored, we can go on and just go through the process that we've seen before. So we're going to apply for example, uh, a couple of levels of Catmull Clark subdivision. And apply, for example, two levels. And I'm going to then smooth the mesh using um, a Laplacian smoothing. And go that like a bit more. So now that we built a system, what we can actually do is we can go back, increase a bit the number of parts in our aggregation. Of course, it's going to be a little bit slow, but it should be reasonably. It shouldn't take too much. And we can always reset to generate a new aggregation if we don't like what we have. And what we can also do is, you see that right now it looks a bit weird because we have these red lines. And that's you might not have those, but that's because I have the mesh edges active. I'm going to deactivate them. It's going to look a bit weird because the colors make everything look a little bit flat. But what we can then do is we can now extract the edges of this using the Weaver Bird Mesh Edges component. And we could use a custom preview. Or if you have human installed, you can use a custom preview line weights. And that's because it's going to show up in the render view as well. And we can now use a swatch to set any color we want for these lines. So now that we're here, we can switch, for example, to Arctic mode. And we can start experimenting. For example, I could start moving my point more in the center of the aggregation. And what that's going to do is it's going to make the center of the aggregation become much larger and the, the edges of that become much smaller. I could, for example, go back and change the, the uh, parameters here. So I could, for example, lower the maximum size. So then what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a very filament-like structure, which looks more like a branching network, as you can see here. But what I can also do is I can turn the whole process upside down and then make it become very large when I'm outside and very small when I'm inside. So it's going to look like a shell somehow around 
my geometry could, for example, move my point again. And so what you can see here is that you have this strategy that you can use to create from a very simple combinatorial aggregation, you can go on and create a more complex uh, resulting pattern which builds a, ge builds, uh, a final mesh from this geometry but uses then parametric strategies to modify each of these geometry in place in order to create a more complex result. So this is it for this tutorial. As always, let me know what you do with it. If you created images, please share them on social media, tag them with the hashtag GHWASP, and I'll be happy to see them and repost them on the WASP channel as well. And that's it for this tutorial, and I'm gonna see you in the last, in the last tutorial of this series tomorrow. Bye.